So has the Christmas season gotten you down? You're tired of all the commercialism, the shopping, the Christmas songs, filled that you can't get your family enough presents? Well, I'll tell you about the best president that we have received in this country. That president came, or I'm sorry, that president came on December 26th, 1776. Yes, I'm taking you all the way back. I'm taking you back to a time that, to perhaps give you something more to celebrate. If, if Christmas tide ha has left you with an empty feeling, if going to the Christ, ma Christ Mass on December 25th has got you down, I'll give you another reason to celebrate. But first, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the background of Christmas here in the colonies. Christmas tide, well, first you have December 1st through December 25th, which is Advent. So time for reflection and reflecting upon the reason for the season. Another cliche or another rhyming uh, thing that we like to say, the reason for the season. Last night I got to my place of employment. We lit our community Christmas tree. I was there. It was fantastic. But because we lit it, we lit it on December 21st. I was quite excited because, well, it was winter solstice. I, I was hoping that all these Christians who are praying would, would realize that we're celebrating the solstice. Well, I get excited because the, the, the Roman Catholics, the popes, tried to trick the pagans and the Romans into following uh, their Christian traditions by usurping the, uh, the pagan traditions and the Roman traditions. So since we know that Jesus Christ was actually not born in the wintertime, we know that this is a, a holiday that was put in place to usurp the holiday of Yule, which is of the burning of the Yule log or of the winter solstice. The days are getting shorter. Uh, this is, um, you know, uh, the trees are dying. You know, things are, are high, animals are hibernating. This is a time for reflection. On December 25th, that's Christ Mass or Christmas, and you go to church. You, set, you worship Jesus, and as I like to say, you're asking for forgiveness for the things you're about to do during Twelfth Night. Twelfth Night is 12 nights of feasting. You feast for the apostles. You go to balls. You eat. You dance. You drink. You gamble. You get married. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson we're both wed in the season of Twelfth Night. Families are together. This is the perfect time to get married. So June Bride, not colonial times. December, January Bride. Um, Twelfth Night, the 12 days of Christmas. Twelfth Night is for the, the Twelfth Night season is for the adults. It's not for children. We have decided in the 19th century to sort of give the, song, the songs that we sing are 19th century songs. Hymns are not sung in churches. They are sung at home. Um, children would get one or two toys. It's not, it's not a, 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 a gift boatload of toys. You got a new outfit. You got a school, a, a book for learning. And you may, if you were lucky, got a new toy. And that went for everyone. That, that included even the governor's children, the royal governor's children. So it's not a big holiday for children. This is a holiday for adults. And uh, at the end of Twelfth Night on Epiphany, January 6th, there's a huge ball and a big cake is brought out. And you're hoping that you don't get the piece with the little bean in it. Because if you get the piece with the little bean in it or the little baby in it, then you have to host the Twelfth Night Celebration the following year and pay for the entire event yourself. So most people are like, well, give me that smallest piece of cake as possible. But getting back to George Washington and the best gift that we ever got, um, I like to, to, to do my uh, Sophia Petrillo. Picture it, December 25th, 1776. 
George Washington soldiers are camped on the Delaware River. The, the men are afflicted with jaundice and dysentery, which is pretty nasty. It's snowing, the water's icy, so they're freezing cold. They don't have food, they don't have supplies. The men are ready to leave. On January 1st, the enlistments are up and these men get to go home. And that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for the chance to go home. Unfortunately, when those enlistments are up and those men go home, that's the end of our army. We have no army. In fact, George Washington, we, we declare independence on July 2nd, 1776, not July 4th. George Washington and the men have effectively lost every single battle. They have the three largest cities in the colonies, Philadelphia, Boston, and New York. They've lost New York. In fact, George Washington and his men in December are beating a fast retreat from New York. Uh, Philadelphia is a lost cause. Congress has actually abandoned Philadelphia for Baltimore. So Philadelphia is written off. The British soldiers, the uh, General Howe, he's waiting. He, he's sitting in fat and happy in New York City. And he is trying to think what the terms of surrender are going to be. Because when that Delaware River freezes over, they're going to march over and hand George Washington the terms of surrender. George Washington has an idea. It says, we're going to go across the river. There's 12, uh, there are 1,200 Hessian soldiers in Trenton, New Jersey. We're going to go over there and we're going to attack them and we're going to beat them. Wow. <laughs> this is amazing. Because while, uh, while George Washington is, is planning this attack, um, he finds out, and if you, saw, if you saw my video on the Pomeranian, uh, the first Pomeranian in America, you will know by December 25th, 1776, General Charles Lee has been captured in Cambridge. So his, his, his forces are, are gone. Uh, General Gates shows up and General Gates is actually voicing his objections. And General Gates, he makes sense. General Gates says, look, George Washington, General Washington, you have no army. Your, your army is made up of, they're not soldiers. They're not disciplined. These are, are boys. Secondly, your, your army only knows how to fight in one direction, and that's beating a retreat. Your men have to learn how to fight, go towards the action, not run away from it. And mind you, Washington's men, they're not experienced soldiers. For the most part, these are 15, 16, 17, 18 year old boys that we're talking about. We're not talking hardened soldiers. You know, we're talking about young farm boys or fish, fishmonger boys from Massachusetts. I mean, we're not talking of a hardened military like you think of today, but we are going against a force of 20,000 men who are experienced soldiers, the best army in the world, the best Navy in the world, which by the way, we don't have a Navy. In fact, if, if, if you and I were going to Vegas to bet on who would win the American Revolution, we'd be betting on the British. <laughs> but he, he points out, you know, that they're, the, the soldiers run away, they're not disciplined soldiers, uh, that the enlistments are up in 11 days or, you know, uh, in, in just a few days. So the men that are there are waiting their time out. Um, that, you know, the Hessians are the best soldiers in the world. They are Europe's elite fighting force. They're the most disciplined soldiers in Europe. Um, and, you know, he also says that, um, that, you know, they, they won't be able to keep the, the attack secret. So that's another big problem is people ratting them out to the Hessians. The German soldiers that are there from, I believe, Pennsylvania, they're, they're afraid as hell. They're scared as fuck at the, at the Hessian soldiers. I mean, th this is the fighting force in the world that they're going to go up against. These boys are scared. And 
General Gates calls Washington a bad leader, and he challenges whether or not he's fit for the position that he holds. And so Washington kicks General Gates out. He says, you get out of here then. And later on, General Gates will get the nickname Granny Gates. So if you know anything about Gates or if you read into him, you'll see why. But there is, um, at this battle, everybody who's anybody, it seems, was there. You have General Nathaniel Green. You have Hugh Mercer, who unfortunately uh, dies a few days later at the Battle of Princeton. General Knox, Alexander Hamilton, General Sullivan. I mean, they're all there. And Colonel Glover, Colonel John Glover, is from Massachusetts. He's a fisherman. And so he's placed in charge of getting these boats and the men across the river. And George Washington wants them to cross within six hours. And, you know, Colonel Glover, who would have been a general, and eventually at the end of the war, by the end of the war, will have achieved the rank of general. Um, he points out to George Washington that nobody can cross that river in six hours. He says, you know, we're, we're going to start at 5.30, 6 o'clock on December 25th, but you have to be ready to attack the, the Hessians in broad daylight in the morning. And he, he asks Gen, uh, General Washington if he's willing to do that. And Washington is adamant, we'll cross in six hours, we'll march from, from the, the, the banks of, of New Jersey all the way into Trenton, we'll go three miles an hour if we have to, and we'll attack them before daylight. Well, that doesn't happen. In fact, it, it takes them all night to cross the river because the, the docks are, the dock that they're leaving from is small, and they're only about they're only able to get about two ships out or two boats I should say not ships we're, we're talking fisher boats row boats of men they're only able to do about two boats at a time and George Washington is not standing in the boat the way that the painting is fuck Washington Irving what well, everything he's told you is a lie if you if you get your history from Washington Irving throw it out it's entertainment it's not history. He's not standing in the boat. He's sitting in the boat. And the men, when they get there, they're wet. They're freezing. These men are exhausted. These young boys are exhausted. You know, they, it takes them all night to cross the river. And the gunpowder is wet. So they know they're going to have to go in using bayonets and not firing their muskets. And General or Colonel Glover... His fishermen want to fight, so they're there. And when they finally get over, they don't have muskets. They have fishing pikes that they're fighting with. And they, they, so they finally get across the river. It takes them all night. So they attack the Hessians at dawn. Or they, I'm sorry, they attack the Hessians at about 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm not going to go too much into the battle, but um, they, they uh, decide to come at the Hessians in, in three different, at three different points. And um, the Hessians who had been celebrating the Christ Mass, drinking and, and, and feasting and carrying on, you know, were groggily awoken to this attack that is not firing at each other, but bayoneting and, and sword fighting and, and fish pikes and, you know, rocks and, you know, not... This is not a, a bang, bang, shoot em up battle. And during the fight, Colonel Rawls, who's in charge of the Hessians, and the Hessians are coming out and they're, they're half dressed, they're in their pajamas, they're halfway in their uniforms. And it's a mess, it's a mess for them. And Colonel Rawls um, is laying there dying and he'll, he will only surrender to George Washington. And he surrenders his sword and Washington tells his men to send it to Congress. And he begs for the men to be able to keep their money and their honor. He says, take everything else, but leave these men with their money and their honor. Um, 
Colonel Rawls is buried at the Presbyterian Church in Trenton. So if you're ever in Trenton and you're curious, uh, you can go visit him. His headstone uh, reads, here lies Colonel Rawls. For him, all is over. That's short and to the point. Um, the battle was over by 930 in the morning. So it took them an hour, about an hour and a half to destroy 2,400 men to destroy 1,200 Hessians. Now, we have, we, we think that's not a great number, but this is also 2,400 men against 20, in, in the grand scheme of the war, 20, over 20,000 soldiers in America and the Navy. So, again, if we go to Vegas, the odds are not on the Americans. The war, the battle's over by 930 They've captured about a thousand of the Hessian soldiers and only four Americans died. This is the first victory that we have. This is what George Washington need. He needed this victory so bad. The future of our country, our country hinged on this one battle. In the grand scheme of things, this battle didn't mean a darn thing strategically. But morally, this was the boost that we needed. This bought us another year. Those men readily went and enlisted, even though there was no money to pay these men for re-enlisting. Those men were riding so morally high that those men went and re-enlisted. And it bought us another year. So if you want to have something to celebrate for Christmas this year, Perhaps you can think about what happened on December 26th in Trenton, New Jersey. Those wet, freezing, tired, exhausted men and boys making it over that river, taking them all night, five o'clock in the evening, they're crossing. They're in battle at eight o'clock in the morning. The battle is over by 930, but after that battle, they don't get to celebrate. They have to go and cross the Delaware River again to put that river between the Americans and the British. So they have no time to celebrate. These exhausted men have no time to rest. So when you think about how miserable you are with your families, in your heated homes, enjoying presents, think about the sacrifice that these men made. And if you're in Trenton, New Jersey, they reenact this battle, or I'm sorry, this crossing every year. And I have a few friends of mine that do uh, the reenacting. So um, if you're in the area, go by and watch. If you're cold, so what? You're, you're, for, you're cold for a few hours. These men didn't get any relief from the cold. And they were wet on top of it and in icy water. And just a little aside, I know it's wonderful to talk about the, the, the shot in the arm we need and how much we needed this, this victory and how important it was. But I'd, I'd just like to say one thing about the Hessians. They are German soldiers. King George, the Hanoverian line, is German. So, of course, we have Hessians coming over. In fact, the Windsor family that rules England now are German, which is also why in the early part of the 20th century, a lot of them were Nazis. Just saying. Edward, right? And his little American girlfriend. Um, but 16,992 Hessians came to fight. Of 16,992 Hessian soldiers, only 10,492 returned to Germany, returned to Europe. So, of the 6,500 Hessians that stayed in America, or, or of the 6,500 Hessians who did not return to Germany, some of them died from their injuries, some of them killed, were killed in war, but the majority of them, the majority of those Hessians became American citizens and lived out their lives here in America. Now, isn't that a great story? And we can talk about that another time. But I just wanted to tell you about the greatest Christmas gift we received. The crossing of, of the Delaware, December 25th, 
5.30 p.m. December 26th, engaging the Hessians in battle at 8 o'clock in the morning. By 9.30, it's over. And we have the biggest morale boost we could ever have. The best Christmas present we could have given to Congress. The best Christmas present we could have ever given to America. It bought us another year. It's a battle of inches. And we got ourselves another year. We bought ourselves some time. So think about that this Christmas. If you need nothing more to celebrate, celebrate George Washington. Celebrate Colonel, uh, Colonel, um, um, I'm sorry, celebrate uh, Colonel Rawls of the Hessians for his bravery and surrendering with honor as he lay dying. He did die in the battle. Um, you know, think about uh, Colonel John Glover, Hugh Mercer, General Green, General Knox, General Sullivan, bye bye Granny Gates. Think about General Lee, who had surrendered, well, was captured in Cambridge by the British or, or joined their forces um, and lost his dog Spotto. Spotto was able was able to cross the enemy lines in order to be returned home only to be lost not only to general lee but to history this video has gone six minutes over but i hope you enjoy it merry christmas happy hanukkah happy solstice uh, happy kwanzaa happy new year enjoy those tax cuts by the way the american revolution was not fought over taxes at least not in the way that most people think, but I'm sure I can do another video on that later. Enjoy your holidays, everyone. Talk to you soon.